Hello, my name is Mad Max. Today is a day where you will understand how a computer works. I am going to explain the basic architecture of our 8-bit computer and then we will go through a simple program and see how it actually works. If you feel overwhelmed at any point through this video, just continue watching to the end because the demonstration is going to make everything much clearer. Let's start with what we know we already have. We already have an ALU, it's over here. And the ALU does all the logic and arithmetic operations, so let's just draw it into our diagram right here. ALU. Cool. Now the ALU has one output and has two inputs. And it's all 8-bit. It's two 8-bit inputs, it's one 8-bit output. That's why I put an 8 next to those arrows. So cool, the ALU gets two numbers and outputs another one, but from where does it get the two numbers? It gets it, or it gets them, from registers. We talked about registers in the last episode, they are just storage. So we have two pieces of storage here, which I shall call B and A. Both of which can output an 8-bit number into the ALU. But where do they get the number from? Well, they get it from the bus. Now, you all heard about a bus if you're even remotely interested with computers, but what is a bus actually? It sounds really complicated, but it's super simple if you come down to it. This red line is our bus. Now, a bus, in our case, is just eight parallel wires. And a bus just connects every single part of our computer together. That's basically it. That's all that there is to it. It's eight parallel wires and everything connects to it. Super simple. But this also brings us to the first problem. So I said A and B get their inputs that say safe, which they can then output into the ALU from the bus. But the ALU also outputs to the bus. Now it's immediately clear that the ALU cannot output at the same time it cannot write at the same time as A and B read. Because then the output from the ALU would feed directly back into A and B and you would get, get a loop. So that doesn't work. So that's the first really important thing you have to keep in mind. There can only be one thing writing to the bus at all time and there should only be one thing listening to the bus at all time. So in other words, you need to control whether or not every single part listens or writes. And in the last episode where I talked about storage, we already learned that we can actually control registers. We can say, okay, register, read now, listen to the bus. Or, okay, register, write to the bus now. We can say that. And we do that with what is called control bits. So we need a control bit here, which I should call AI. And we need one here, which I should call BI. So that's A input and B input. Basically, when it's just a wire, and when there is five volt or one on this wire, then A or B respectively listen to what is in the bus. Similarly, we need uh, to control the output of A and B. They output directly into the ALU, and the way the ALU is built is that as soon as it gets input, it puts it also has an output. That's just the way I designed the ALU. You can design it differently. You can, right here, you can just have, um, just basically have another switch right, and control when it outputs, but the way I designed my ALU is just that as soon as it gets input from A and B, it outputs something. So we need a way to control when A and B have an output. Now A and B always write to the ALU at exactly the same time, because we need two numbers for the operations the ALU can perform. So that means that the second control bit is the same for both, because we want to trigger them both at the same time. I call that AB output, ABO. We also need some control bits for the ALU, and I talked about the four control bits for the ALU. It is ALU enable, then it is A invert, and then it's function one and function zero. We talked about this in the last episode. Basically, it just controls what the ALU actually does. If it adds, subtracts, and or whatever. Cool, so now we already have a really big part of our computer done. 
we can store information and then we can control when it's sent to the ALU and then the ALU can send it to where exactly? Where does this data go? Or another question, where does this data come from? Well, it comes from the RAM. A RAM is just a bigger piece of storage. This right here is one times eight bits of storage, both. Whereas this is 16 times 8 bits of storage. And it can both write 8 bits and receive 8 bits. And also, of course, like those registers right here, the RAM also has control lines. RAM input, RAM output. So if RAM input is enabled, the RAM can be written to, right? So whatever is in the bus is written to the RAM. Then RAM output is enabled the RAM outputs something to the bus. So, for example, what we could do is we could have ABO set to one and RAM in set to one and then ALU enable set to one and that's it would cause those two numbers to be fed into the ALU and it would cause the ALU to output a number which would then be written into the RAM. So this way we can control from where to where we send information. But here's a problem. A RAM, again, as I talked about in the last episode, it needs a memory address. Because it has 16 times 8 pieces of memory, we need to tell the RAM which of the 16 to activate, or which of the 16 to read to, uh, to, to write to, or which of the 16 to read from. So we need a memory address. The memory address, if you remember, I talked about a couple of times already, we have an 8-bit number. Let's say we have this, um, 1001. There's a first four numbers are the opcode, which is basically, uh, which basically tells the computer what to do. And the last four bits are the address, the memory address. Well, sorry for my writing. <laughs> so we need to send the memory address to this RAM. Well, we could use the bus for this, but here's a problem. If we would send, both the memory address and the number we want to write to the RAM at the same time, it would be something like this. Let's say we want to write the, uh, the ALU wants to write the number 11110000. And let's say we want to write it to the memory address 1111. Oops, that's just those four ones. If you would send both of those through the uh, bus at the same time, then we would get 11111111. Right? So that wouldn't work. We cannot actually send the memory address through the bus at the same time as we're sending different information through the bus as well. So it's just the same problem that we're having here. We cannot output information from the ALU and input information to the ALU from the bus at the same time, which is the reason why we have A and B. They basically buffer, they store a number, they buffer a number so that the, bu the bus is then free so that the ALU can write. The same is true for the RAM. The RAM has a register that is called memory address register, MAR, which outputs a 4-bit number, which is the memory address to the RAM, and which gets a 4-bit number, which is the memory address from the bus. It only has one control bit, which is MAR input. So the way it works is the following. We put a memory address in here, so we enable MI, so that means that this now reads whatever is in the bus, then we put the memory address in the bus, it's read, and then it's permanently being put out to the RAM. The RAM still doesn't do anything because it still waits for either RI or RO to be enabled. So the way it would work is like this. We would activate MI, then we would send a memory address, then we would deactivate MI. MR, the, the memory address register would have stored the memory address and put it into the RAM at all times. Then we would activate RAM input and we would activate ABO and the control bits for the ALU, which would cause the ALU to send whatever it just did, right, basically its output, so let's say A, A plus B, into the RAM, to the memory address that is stored in its memory address register. Finally, we need to be able to output something on this. So we need a display, maybe an LED display, and we don't just want to output it for a small duration of time, we want to output it as long as it's true. So we need an output register that stores the number,
and then we need an output register in OI and that's basically almost it. But now the question arises, who controls all of this? Who controls all of these uh, control bits? And the answer is, well, the control matrix does. The control matrix sits somewhere and it is wired to all of these, all of these uh, control bits. And it decides which control bit to activate at which time based on the opcode it gets. For every opcode, there's a specific number of things that the control matrix does. In total, for every opcode, there are six steps that the control matrix does. And to do this, it's actually wired to a counter, which is basically a clock. And the counter is a ring counter. That means uh, it looks something like this. So uh, it has six outputs in our case, because every opcode has six stages, so-called T stages. And the way it does is that one output is activated each time. So this is active, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and so on. It goes round and round. But only one output of the ring counter is active at all time. And the time it takes to get from one output to the another is also always the same. Let's say a second. Okay, so for one second it's here, the next second it's, second it's here, the next second is here, and so on and so forth. This way, we can have one opcode, but we can have six different things for each opcode. And the way the control matrix works in detail is really complicated, and I will talk about that in the next episode, most likely. To make this work, we need a couple more things, however. Uh, the control matrix does all kinds of stuff, right? It enables and disables all those control bits, but it needs the opcode at all times. So what do we do? Just like we have a memory address register, that gives the memory address to the RAM at all times. We have an instruction register that gives the opcode into the control matrix at all times. Sounds complicated? It will be all really clear once you actually see the demonstration. Okay, now we need just one more thing, one more thing to complete our computer and then I will actually let a simple program run through this schematic and then you will understand how it works. We need something called a program counter. It is also called instruction address register and it has three control bits, one called jump, one called counter out and one to increment the counter, basically. Our program, which we want to execute is stored in RAM. Okay, so in RAM, uh, we have, you know, we have a couple of memory addresses. Addresses, okay, uh, so we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, okay. And at each of these addresses is stored one of these numbers, opcode and memory address. So the operation and to what address you want to do that op operation. So for example, if you do addition, right, it would be something like this. It would be uh, 1000, which is the opcode for addition. And then we would need a memory address where to store the result of the addition. So let's say uh, the memory address is 0101. Okay. So long story short, the program is saved in RAM. And all the program counter does is that we can set it to a specific number with a jump command. So we set it to 0000, zero, zero, zero. and then every time we set this to high, CE to high, it just counts plus one. So the program counter would behave like this. If it's originally set to 0000, zero, 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 right, it would output this, then we would send CE, and then it would output this, if you actually set the output bit, that is. And then we send another CE, and then it would output this. And then we send another CE, and it would output this, and so on. It always increments by one. But we can also send it a jump command and set it to whatever we want. And then it starts to increment. Okay, it basically just increments by one. Uh, and this way we get a memory address that gives us the next command in RAM. Confused? 
Well, I can understand that you are confused. So that is the reason why now I will actually walk you through a program. Okay, I will actually work you through a really simple computer program and then you will hopefully understand how all this works. So the computer program we want to do is A plus B equals C. Really simple, a simple addition. Okay, here is how it works. The first three steps are always the same. They are called fetch cycle. First, CO is activated. So our program counter now outputs a memory address at the same time, MI is activated, so the memory address is saved in the memory address register. Second step, the program counter is incremented by one. Third step, RAM out and input in is enabled. In other words, the value stored at the memory address that was supplied by the program counter is being transferred from RAM to the instruction register. Keep in mind that this value is the command we actually want to execute. The first four digits are the opcode, which is the command we want to execute. The next four digits are a memory address. In our case, the command is 0010, which means load a number from RAM to A. And the memory address is the address A is stored at, which, as it happens, is also 0010. Those first three steps are always the same. Basically, all that happens is that the next instruction is actually loaded into the instruction register. So the next steps actually execute the command. Fourth step, IO and MI is enabled. The memory address stored in the instruction register is transferred to the memory address register. This address points not to an instruction, but instead to the 8-bit binary number, which is A. Fifth step. RO and AI is enabled. In other words, the number stored at the memory address in the memory address register is transferred to the A register. Now we do the same thing for B. First, COMI. The MIR now points to the second instruction. Second, CE. We increment the counter. Third, ROII. Instruction is transferred to the instruction register. The instruction this time is 0011, which means load B. Fourth step, IOMI is enabled. This memory address points to 0100, which is where B is stored. Fifth step, ROBI. The number B is transferred from RAM to the B register. So now we have A in the A register, we have B in the B register, so all we need to do now is to actually add those two numbers together and store the result. First step, COMI. Second, increment the counter. Third, load instruction into the instruction register. This instruction reads 1000, which is addition, and the memory address is 0101, which is the address where we want to store the result C. Fourth step, IOMI prepare the memory address register so that C can actually be saved in RAM. Fifth step, A, B, O, R, I, A, E. A and B output their numbers to the ALU, which is activated and set to addition. It outputs the number C, which is stored at address 0101. The program is complete. Even if you have longer and more complicated programs, it comes down to this. A couple simple steps, transferring instructions from one point in the computer to a different one. That's all there is to it. My name is Matt Max. thanks for watching this episode, and tune in next time when I will talk about a sampler and the control matrix.